Well, it is the Toby Griffin Show. We're broadcasting live from London today, ahead of tomorrow's coronation that you might have heard is happening. And joining me now in the studio, we have Dr. Ed Owens, who's a historian, royal commentator and author. Good afternoon. How are you? Yeah, good afternoon. I'm really well, thank you. Pleased to be here. Yes, it's great to have you here. And you just flew in from Paris last night, right? Well, actually, I got the Eurostar. Oh, of course, yeah. Uh, and there were, there, were plenty, there were plenty of people coming across, though, for the, uh, the coronation, I could see. Quite a lot of American tourists that have clearly been spending some time in Paris yeah. but were gearing up for a, a weekend of a London experience. Yeah, and have you been walking around? I don't know, you've probably been doing loads of press today, but have you have, had time to see all the crowds everywhere? I have. I've been taking in the crowds from about 6.20 this morning when, wow. <laughs> when I first rocked up at uh, Westminster Abbey to do some media work. Wow. Uh, and really since then, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been an interesting day. Uh, I've been into a, a few pubs to do interviews as oh, well. Wow. If foreign broadcasters love to come to the UK and they're like we've got to visit a British pub we've got to go and we've got to we've got to te- we've got to we've got to do the interview in the most British of places <laughs> and, and, they, and you know they're draped in all the in all the royal finery all the all the all the flags all the bunting yeah it's uh, it's been interesting to see it but yeah it's, it's London in full colour well I'm sorry this isn't quite a pub and it wasn't quite <laughs> the gold coach that brought you here either <laughs> now this is the silliest question you've been asked all day no doubt but what actually is a coronation because King Charles III is already the king. He became the king when the queen died. Mm-hmm. So what does tomorrow mean? You're absolutely right. The, the king became uh, king the moment uh, the queen died, and that's because uh, the idea of the, the crown as embodied by the reigning monarch never dies. Um, mm. It's this idea that the, 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 the king or queen has two bodies, a mortal body and an eternal body. Yeah. So this is, if you like, putting the cherry on the icing tomorrow. Uh, what it is, it's the, the formal sacralization uh, of this this new status of our king. Uh, most important of all, as part, as part of the coronation, isn't actually the crowning moment when the, the crown is placed on the monarch's head. It's the anointing with holy oil. Mm. This is the moment when uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Justin Welby, will make a small uh, cross on the forehead of our king. And in doing so, he is, if you like, bequeathing God's grace on that monarch. Now, if yeah. you go back sort of seven or 800 years, it used to be the case that the monarch wanted to be the one anointed because, of course, there were all these other people competing for that role. Yeah. And, if, and if you hadn't been anointed, someone else would try and get anointed <laughs> and then they'd become the monarch. So that's the change. Um, and that is the, the centrepiece of tomorrow's coronation, this anointing with holy oil. And that part is going to be kind of away from the cameras, right? It's going to be kind of covered up. You're absolutely right. The, uh, the anointing is the only bit that we're not going to see as part of the televised broadcast because it's meant to be an intimate moment between the deity and uh, and God's representative on earth and just like in 1953 this isn't going to be to be made public yeah now what are the other key moments to look out for in the coronation that maybe people forget so there are there are four or five key stages. Um, this is uh, a different ceremonial c- uh, event compared to 1953. Quite a lot of yeah. the the elaborate ritual has been stripped away, mainly because it it just doesn't feel very in touch with our 21st century. Um, but it starts with a thing called the recognition, uh, and in that moment, the king is presented to the four corners of what's called the coronation theatre. Uh, mm. So the four parts of Westminster Abbey, symbolically, the four corners of the world. Yeah presented to his people as representative of his people. Um, This is followed by uh, the swearing of an oath. The oath is the secular aspect of this coronation ritual. It's where he will swear to uphold the laws of the land, uh, to serve his people. Uh, We then have the anointing with holy oil, followed by the investiture with all the regalia, uh, the various sort of scepters, um, the the orb. Uh, You're going to see various other bits. Of course, the crown. Uh, as well, which and then you're going to see right at the end what's called the enthronement, where he is going to be lifted into what's called St Edward's throne. Uh, underneath it, that is the the the, st- the stone of of scone or scone. Yes, uh, depending, scone. I think. Uh, is it scone? Is that how you say it, Northern yeah. Border? Yeah. Okay. Uh, which has come down from Scotland, especially for this this event, a symbolic uh, a symbolic stone representing the union between England and Scotland, uh, and that is the final piece of sort of elaborate ritual. Yeah, and that St. Edward's chair is really old, isn't it? Because it looks it. It really is. It's the oldest piece of furniture.
furniture in the United Kingdom still used for its original purpose. Wow, that's <laughs> an incredible fact. <laughs> well, maybe it is. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the differences, I suppose, is that this is, of course, the 1953 coronation was the first to be televised, and this is even more televised. There's much more cameras everywhere you walk down the street along the procession route. There's TV cameras everywhere. Mm, you're absolutely right. The 1953 coronation was the first time that they let the cameras into Westminster Abbey. A big mass media moment in terms of the history of television, uh, and a big, a big mass media moment in terms of the history of the monarchy. Now, of course, we live in this, yeah, this world where we've got screens all around us. Yeah. Uh, we've got them in the palms of our hands as well. Um, and as you say, there are these big screens throughout throughout central London for, for people's viewing pleasure. Yeah, and do you think that the crowds are all going to come out and people are going to want to kind of watch it? Because this is probably the biggest kind of national event in our lifetimes, maybe. In yeah, and it's an interesting observation. I'd say two things. Yeah. I don't think the enthusiasm of the, the British public is anything like it was back in 1953. Mm -hmm. um, there was a huge level of anticipation, sort of 16 months worth of build-up before the 53 coronation. And Elizabeth II was very, very popular. Um, yeah not least because she was this sort of young symbol of, of, of optimism and enthusiasm. King Charles has come to the throne, different kind of personality. I think the procession route through central London has been made deliberately shorter because they want to make sure the crowds look big on the, on the, on the, on the day. They don't yeah. want it to look sort of like people are, that, 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 that the crowds are too thin. So I think there's a, there is a steady build-up of enthusiasm, but it's, it's not comparable to 1953. And I think it also tells us a little bit about the monarchy standing in, in 2023 as opposed to 50, 1953. Yeah, and, and why do you think um, Charles appears to be less popular than his mother? Is it simply because there's big shoes to fill or is it because of the man himself? Partly you're right. It's about the big shoes that, that, that to fill and the fact that really since... Uh, Elizabeth died, there has been this kind of uh, symbolic hole at the centre of the monarchy. Um, I would also suggest that, you know, he's a much more complicated individual than his mother ever was in terms of his public image. Yeah. Since the 1980s, we've known about these sort of human frailties, uh, the fact that he's made mistakes. Um, we know a lot more about him. And whilst we might think that the issue of environmentalism is something that would naturally appeal to a sort of environmentally conscious younger generation, it's just not resonating because mm -hmm. I think they see see it as a symbolic gesture and it's and in terms of real world impacts it's not necessarily having that effect so yeah. i think he's there's a bit of a, a dissonance between what he's trying to achieve and and how younger people feel especially and you mentioned earlier about the stone of schoon or whatever however you pronounce it also known as the stone of destiny hmm. what's the purpose of that because i've seen a lot on social media people just being like what in hmm. the 21st century we have a stone uh, and it's <laughs> transported like it's like it's the king, actually, with all that ceremony. That's absolutely right. So let's call it the Stone of Destiny so, to avoid my <laughs> awful pronunciation. But the um, it, it is it's a, it, it is about the symbolism of monarchy. And if yeah. we go back 700, 800 years, the, the significance of spiritual symbolism ar around things like this stone w w would have made sense to the public. They they were more in sort of enamoured with this idea of symbolism. As, as yeah. you rightly point out, in the 21st century, a lot of this symbolism we just don't get. Yeah. And hence, we've had quite a lot of media organisations, notably the BBC this week, trying to explain this symbolism <laughs> uh, to the public. And I think some of it will stick and some of it we will make sense of. Some of it, though, sort of just sort of drifts over people's head. And I, I think that's kind of natural. We're not as engaged with the idea of symbolism in this country anymore compared to how we were 30, 40, 50, 70 years ago, 700 years ago. Yeah. So what are the some of the key historical coronation things that you find quite interesting? Well. Uh, this is a coronation that uh, follows in a tradition of modern coronations that really started in 1902. Um, I think we have to situate uh, this coronation in the context of a monarchy that needs to survive. Yeah. So the story of the monarchy over the last 150 years has been, OK, there are these people uh, called members of the public. They have voting power. If they want to get rid of us, they can get rid of us. Mm. And the, the monarchy has, since the late 19th century, basically thought to itself that it's got to make itself accessible and meaningful. Yeah. So cer the ceremony, the ritual of coronations has been a way of making a statement about monarchy. Yeah. Central, central to the modern British nation, 
It's a symbol meant to, it's meant to be a symbol of unity, maybe not right now, uh, but nevertheless, uh, that is an important as- a- element of this of this particular kind of ceremony. Yeah, and if it's survived since the late nineteenth um, century with that view, um, is there any reason why it can't survive even further now? I think that the monarchy can absolutely survive. It's definitely gone through more challenging periods than is currently the case. Mm. But what those challenging periods have required is an active program of modernization. Yeah. And I think the challenge that the current House of Windsor has is that it, it has, has uh, so far shown no sense of sort of a, a bigger desire to modernize, to do things completely differently. Past monarchs have done it, and they've done it very successfully. As recently as 110 years ago, I know it doesn't sound very recent, <laughs> but, but there was a king called George V, Elizabeth II's grandfather, yeah. huge program of modernization. And if you like, it's, it, he, he set the foundations on which Elizabeth's reign was built. Yeah. I think we're now going through another difficult period, and I think we need to see a program of modernization from the monarchy if it is to survive. Yeah. And you mentioned that a coronation is a way of kind of improving the perception of the monarchy. Mm-hmm. and um, you know making people support them um, it, c- it can go the other way of course and I think we've seen that with people saying why are you spending all this money on a coronation absolutely um, and you know the, p- the part of the narrative that the royal household promoted early on was that this was a, a streamlined event a, a, a scaled down coronation yeah 2,000 invited guests, which does sound a lot, compared to the 5,000 that were invited in 1953. Now, I think this is a bit of a red herring, Mm. because this is likely to be the most expensive coronation ever staged, um, when we take into consideration especially the security costs. I was wandering around uh, central London last night trying to find my hotel, (laughs) and on the the way, the police presence in central London at the moment is extraordinary. So, um, we'll never find out fully what the security costs of this event uh, are going to be, but it's anticipated to be something between 100 and 150 million pounds. Well, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And there's police in London at the best of times, but exactly. there is loads. You can't walk down the street without seeing the police, which is interesting. Um, and what are you doing tomorrow? How are you spending the coronation day? Are you working on the press or uh, are you going to be there camping out with I'm the fans? Be, I, well, good question. I'm going to be doing a bit of both. Um, yeah. So I'm uh, just finishing uh, a, a new book about this um, which I'm going to tell you the title if that's okay yeah, that's it's, fine. <laughs> it's, called, it's, it's called After Elizabeth oh. Can the Monarchy Save Itself and uh, I'm approaching this uh, the, the, the opening section is focusing in on this event in particular and I'm looking forward to going and having a chat with some of the crowds Ooh. so that I can use some of the conversation I have about this event in the, in the book um, but apart from that uh, I will also be doing quite a lot of media work so it'll be, be trying to combine a bit of the two yeah well good luck with chatting to the crowds because you go down there <laughs> when you've already arranged an interview with them and they're getting approached from all sorts of organisations so That's you right. have to wait your turn I will be <laughs> <laughs> well many thanks for joining us and because you're the last live interview of the day all those chocolates and biscuits are yours <laughs> too kind thank you very much for having me